thank you, Kent. We're going to be looking at Acts 24 and 25 tonight. So hopefully we can join in looking at that. Overall, what, we're, what we are doing is looking at the life of Jesus. Uh, no, not the life of Jesus. We're looking at the life of Paul. And we're looking at kind of his life chronologically, looking at when he wrote letters. Um, not trying to get all the details out of the book of Acts, but kind of the, so we understand Paul and what he went through and to be able to encourage us as well. God was with Paul. The Spirit was working in his life. He was missional-minded, missional taking the gospel to the Gentiles, and, uh, and kind of around chapter 21 or so, he goes back to, uh, to Jerusalem, and he did that, went in there doing the Nazarite vow, it seems like, and the Jews were out to get him. They end up, they're going to, when they... Uh, Accuse him of things here in a little bit. They're going to accuse him of, of starting a riot. And his point is, hey, I just kind of got into town, but even here a week, how could I have started a riot? So anyway, he uh, goes to that, but he's arrested, and he goes before the Sanhedrin, and then uh, they're going to try to kill him, and and uh, the governor comes along, and and of course he says, hey, I'm a I'm a Roman citizen. And they're like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. They need to investigate that, and they do, and it's a good thing, and uh, all of that. But we're going to see the political system of that day was kind of unique because you had the Roman government, and then you had the, uh, the Jews who were kind of a nation to themselves, uh, slowly changing in history at that point. And uh, they, the, uh, the Jewish people, some of the Jewish people were out to get Jesus. They were out to get Paul because of what he did at this point as well. And uh, it's, it's an interesting battle between, is this my responsibility or yours between the Roman government, the Sanhedrin, and and all of that. Obviously, the Apostle Paul had a reputation among the Jews. They knew what he was, what he had done, how he could, had converted, and they were not happy about that. They were, they were trying to put his life, life out, I guess you could say, trying to take his life. And uh, we'll see more of that spirit, mentality, and thought in what we read tonight. And, of course, the Roman government people have to kind of uh, walk the fine line between what is popular and what is right, and they don't always do what's right. But, that being said, the whole time God is under control. God has picked the perfect person to go through this and to get him uh, to Rome eventually to preach the gospel and to write some more letters and have a greater impact that way. So God's spirit was always at work and even more so because they didn't have the Bible at this point. They didn't have the New Testament at this point. In fact, not all New Testament books have even been written to this point. So a lot of things are going on. So we're going to try to cover two chapters. I don't know if we will be able to do that or not, but Frank is going to read chapter 24 and just kind of concentrate the best you can a lot of things that stand out to you. So Frank's going to read for us now. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders of his church, or if they're named Tertullius, these gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullius began his accusation, saying, See that through the... See that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is brought upon brought to, brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most able feelings, with all thanksgivings. 
nevertheless, to be tedious, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him, and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by with great violence and took him out of our hands, commanding his ac accusers to come to you. By examining him and examining himself, you may assert all these things of which, uh, of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, or assented, maintaining that these things were so. Now the next several verses is going to be under the heading of the defense before Felix. This is verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor, had nodded to him to speak answer, and so much as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may assert that is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so worship the God of my Father, leaving all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience of without offense to the Lord God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with turmoil. They sought to have been there before you. They ought to have been here before you to object that they anything that they might have against me, or else that those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing and, and the wall I stood before the council, unless it is for the one statement which I cried out standing among them. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by your by you this day. At the importance of it, I'm going to read verse 21 once more. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and to hold him not and to forbid and don't forbid any of his friends to provide to provide for or visit him. And after some days when Felix came with his wife Priscilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about the righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now, go away for now, and I'll have a convenient time I'll we'll call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, uh, uh, Por Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor and left Paul bound. Okay. Uh, the Lord, you said, we, many of us probably do this too. We do what's convenient for us, and I kind of feel like that's what a lot of these people are doing, but there's more pressure on, on them as, as uh, Felix being governor and that type of thing, uh, trying to make everybody happy. Uh, and he was pretty full of himself, thinking he might get some money out of it. That, that's uh, the love of money is the root of a lot of evil, all kinds, a variety of all kinds of evil. So anyway, kind of interesting. I'm not saying that all politicians are crooked. I'm just saying that um, 
that there's a lot of pressure on men, like there is for us sometimes to do do the right thing. It might be at as low level as our grandkids are asking us to do something. We we compromise and kind of do what what's in our best interest sometimes in their best interest and that type of thing. All right, Paul, uh, before the legal people, and we kind of relax because we know the rest of the story, but Paul had to be relaxed because, remember last time, God said, I'm, you're going to Rome, but well, at least he knows that, and he's going to get a, a good escort, and uh, even as we look at last week's lesson, they had a bunch of military people that escorted Paul to Caesarea. And according to verse 27, that he was there at least two years before Felix was succeeded by Festus. Uh, but, but he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, so he left Paul in prison. So he, he was kind of used as a pawn. Uh, Paul didn't feel that way, I don't think. <clears throat> Uh, he knew he was in God's hands, and I think that that is really, really powerful. But they're accusing him of a lot of things. They're embellishing the story. Uh, they they label him as a troublemaker, uh, stirring up riots among the Jews, and that he is the ring leader of this uh, sect. And uh, they're trying to do all they can to make people bias. And so it's, it's kind of a, a big struggle there. Let me just pause there. Anything in that chapter that stands out to you? It's amazing how you can twist the story, twist events to fit your category. Mm -hmm. It just reminds me of so much of what's going on now in our country. I mean, depending on which side you listen to, uh, the same event is told two different, two, three, four, five different ways. Yeah. And it's, you know, they can't all be true. Yeah. And uh, especially when this orator, why they had to have him, I guess they, they wanted to impress Felix. Right. Uh, I don't like the one where he says, uh, that the, this commander came down and with great violence took Paul away from him. Uh, you go back and read, you know, the, the violence was committed by the Jews beating up Paul. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's uh, this chapter is almost laughable when, when you read it. it. It reminds me so much of the trial of Jesus. It's, uh, I think it shows our bias. You know, how do we sometimes getting to truth is a challenge? Sometimes we're blinded. Well, when you hate somebody, you can go to any length. Yeah, you you ignore your own mistakes and you see the mistakes everybody else has. So that's uh, yeah. Mistakes. Well, they are human. Yeah. Frank, the thing that uh, caught my attention was Paul speaking, and he calls this one man to be afraid, and now that's that's a uh, that's, that's quite a speaker that can, that can do that to a crowd. Yeah. A single person or a crowd. Uh, it, verse 9 uh, really emphasizes their their confidence. Their, uh, maybe, maybe they were wanting it to be right. They are asserting that these things are true. So that's that's uh, a large part of it. It's kind of interesting that they call uh, Paul a follower of the way. Uh, of course, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So they're saying, accusing him of following this person who claimed to be the way. Uh, but he talks about the resurrection. And that every time Paul talks about the resurrection, they get really stirred up, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So, um, you get the feeling at verse 22 that Felix is kind of afraid to make a decision. Because it talks about uh, that he had knowledge, more accurate knowledge of the way. Yeah. So he, he knew more about Christianity than 
Right. Then just many rumors. Of, yeah. Maybe you want to let on. And I think uh, you know, I get the impression that he'd release Paul, except he's afraid of the Jews. Right. And I'll pass the buck on to somebody else. Yeah. And maybe God was keeping him under. I mean, even though he was in prison, he was in jail. God may have been protecting him with all these people around him until he could get him out of town and get to, to Rome. Uh, it was not a fair trial. And God always has the last word in the long run. Uh, but he didn't have to stay there for two years. Um, I'm sure he was... I, I bet two years seemed like 20 years to Paul. As much as he'd been traveling and how much desire he had to go to other places, and he just couldn't. But but he uh, he didn't go crazy. He very much trusted God, and and surely believed that God was working in his life and the situation. He had some freedom, and his friends could come and go to see him. Yes. So that would help a lot. Yeah, there in verse twenty-three. So God is working. It just seems like it's very frustrating. We see the injustice and we see lots of other things. Uh, I think it's interesting that Felix, who came with his wife, Drusilla, uh, says down in verse 25, when I find it convenient, I'll send for you. How many Bible studies have you tried to set up? And, and somebody said, well, when it's convenient, when I, when I can make it work. And they don't realize the urgency of the spiritual life and death of this. So we have to be patient, uh, but also be persuasive, persuasive, persuasive and do what we can. But all things said and done, again, there, verse 26. Uh, he was hoping, his motive was that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent him for him frequently and talked with him. It makes me uh, think of this. This person is no longer alive, but my dad's best man in his wedding ended up becoming the county sheriff. And my oldest brother, who back in the day did get involved in drugs and had a lot of issues and he ran from the police and a lot of things. But the sheriff came to my dad and said, give me some money and we'll just dismiss all of it. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's kind of what I feel like is kind of happening here. Uh, we, we can probably take care of this with just a little bit of money. <laughs> that's where I grew up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as, you know, we have systems and we have... Uh, good people in those systems and there's whole there's cracks in the system at times and uh, things don't always go like we want hey here's the good news for you and me i guess is because my brother spent that 30 days in jail it uh, got my attention that better obey the law and uh, it had a big impact on me thinking about god and, and all of that so it was a good thing for me okay uh, and, and everything turned out well. All right, let's go to chapter 25. Ken Hollingsworth is going to read verses 1 through 12. This is Paul on trial before Festus. You remember we, we moved from Felix to Festus? So Ken's going to read for us. Now, where did Travis disappear? Oh, you've got the microphone. Good, there you are. <laughs> Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priest and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing to ambush him, uh, to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held in Caesarea, 
and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if a man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight to ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem to it around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. This is wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand before uh, me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing in Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus, Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Pretty powerful. I think that uh, uh, his nationality, the fact that he was a Roman citizen appealing to Caesar, really was going to help him. Um, what, what, what stands out to you guys? What, what's, do, you, do you see where Festus comes on to Caesar, but he pretty quickly goes to uh, to Jerusalem, it says goes uh, up to Jerusalem. That's that's up in elevation. Caesarea was along, uh, you know, if you see the Bible lands along the the coast there. So Caesarea was right there. Uh, it was named after one of the Caesars. Uh, but he went up, even though it's kind of south and east. Us Oklahomans, if you go south, that means you go down. Usually. We go down to Dallas and that type of thing. But elevation-wise, it was up. So that's that's the way they looked at it. And he goes down there to eight or ten days. And then he goes back. And I, I'm sure he learned a lot. He probably heard a lot of rumors. He probably got a little information. But, uh, but he asked Paul to make a defense, and he gets to, uh, to do all of that. And they couldn't prove anything against Paul, which probably helped in a lot of ways, but uh, to help clear his name. And he asked, Festus asked Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem? I don't know what Festus was thinking. I don't know if he was trying to win some political points. Um, and he probably thought, hey, you're an innocent guy, so let's go back and just confront your accusers. But again, God had a plan. God was working all along. And uh, he said, I'm, I'm right where I need to be. I'm in court. The legal system is working. And God's going to make it work out right. And he, he just eventually says, I appeal to Caesar. And that's... Uh, a lot of power there, you know. If you tried to appeal to the president of the United States, he'd probably say, "Who are you?" But with Paul, his citizenship uh, would get him uh, a fair hearing. And of course, Festus, I think, figured out, "Hey, that's probably a pretty good deal. Let's just send him to Caesar. So you're going to go there. You're going to you're going to get what you wish for." And of course, I want to say going to get what God wants. God is in control. Anything else stand out to you guys there? Yes, Doris? The fact that he's not afraid to die. His faith is still so strong that he's still not afraid to die. Yeah. 
we we never know what all will happen in our lifetime, but I hope we are uh, have have enough faith in God that because really serving God is the most important thing. Ellis, one one of the things I see is is Paul's not willing to compromise his his belief in God, and no matter what what goes on. No matter how much they accuse him, no matter how much they threaten him, he still has that trust in God to know that God's with him. He delivered him out of that town. You remember when they when he had that bunch of Jews that was going to kill him? Mm -hmm. Not eat anything. You wonder if they're still walking around without anything to eat. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Two years later, when yeah. Saw, when they saw him coming down the street with all those soldiers down, and God protecting his man. Yeah. They probably started looking for a McDonald's or something around the corner, you know. But Paul, Paul is, is, is setting an example for us, I believe, that, that when we commit to God, we commit to God. And, and sometimes it's rough and sometimes it's not rough. Mm -hmm. not, not because, maybe not because of, of something that, maybe it's, not, maybe it's our fault. Maybe we were praying on ourselves. But we need to be as committed as Paul was and, and just stand firm. Yeah, I think that we can all grow more in our faith in God. God is in control. This, this is our Father's world. And whether it's an illness, whether it's a financial disaster, whether it's whatever it may be, we should pray and trust God. And um, do what we can, and just know God's going to work out things, um, even though it may be very difficult. Janet, I think uh, when you were, you remember when ISIS was taking over and we were seeing on the news, there were Coptic Christians that they were beheading, and I remember seeing a vision. I mean, seeing one where uh, one of the guys was just. Saying Jesus, about the time his head was probably going to be chopped off. And that to me just made a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Then I hope that if something ever happened to me like that, that's what I would do. You know, what else are you going to do? You've got to trust God. Yeah. Very good. All right, now Doug is going to read the rest of the story. Verses 13 through 27. Being. After certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea to visit Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus set before the king the matters against Paul, saying, A certain man has been left prisoner by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the Jewish elders informed me of him and asked a sentence against him. I told them it is not customary for Romans to hand over any man until the one being charged faces his accusers and has an opportunity to defend himself against the charge. Therefore, when they came, I did not delay, but sat on the judgment seat of the, the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. The accusers did not charge him with evil deeds, as I was expecting, but certain questions about their own religion and about a certain Jesus, Jesus who had died, but whom Paul was claiming to be alive. I was at a loss about these things, and I asked he might be willing to go to Jerusalem and to be judged there about these things. However, when Paul appealed to, the, to be held in custody, for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be held until I could send him up to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, well, I myself was wishing to hear the man. He replied, you shall hear him tomorrow. Well, the next day when Agrippa and Bernice came, they entered the auditorium with an elaborate pageantry, accompanied by chief captains and prominent citizens of the city. When Festus gave the order, Paul was led in. Festus said, King Agrippa, 
and all men present with us, look at this man against whom all of the multitude of the Jews has brought complaints, both in Jerusalem and here, crying that he must not live any longer. I did not find that he had done anything deserving death, but since he had appealed to the emperor, I determined to send him in. I do not have anything definite to write to my Lord about him, so I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so, so that after a preliminary hearing, I might have something to write. It seems unreasonable to me not to indicate the charges against the prisoner when you send him. Very good. Uh, which is which is fair and right. You know, we're not just going to send him off. There needs to be some kind of charge, but he has that privilege and responsibility. <clears throat> uh, they're trying to. They would love for Paul to be tried back in Jerusalem. He's wanting to go to Rome to get a more fair trial, less bias, and all of that. But they're trying to do all they can to make things bias. Uh, anything stand out to you guys? Yes, Alice? I, to me, with all of this going on, the, Paul has totally confused the dignitaries, and they don't know what to do with him. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Jesus said you're going to be arrested and tried before people, and I'll give you the right words to say. I feel like God is giving him the right words to say in all of this. Um, and God does know the future, so that, that's, the, that's a real key part of, of it, I think. They do end up ordering him just be held in Caesarea until they can get a group of people to get him loaded up and, and go to Rome. Phil! Yeah, but the amazing thing about this to me is, is that with all the bureaucracy and so forth, what God wanted done exactly got done at the time he wanted it done. Just like with Jesus, when it was time for, for Jesus to go to the cross, well, all the, all the pieces fell into place and God's will was done. Right. In this case, uh, it was time for Paul to go to Rome almost, and uh, they got all the ducks in a row, got all the bureaucrats uh, working on the, working toward that, and they got it done. Mm -hmm. uh, and Paul going to Rome was was a blessing. Right. All these dignitaries, powerful movers and shakers, all thought they were in control, and little did they realize that God was in control. Eighty-four. Sowing seeds in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep, sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, steering me the clouds for winter chilly breeze, flying by the harvest. And the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. Going even weeping, sowing for the master, for the lost sustained our spirit often grieves. When your weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep, 
Ringing in the sheep, ringing in the sheep, we shall come rejoicing, ringing in the sheep, ringing in the sheep, ringing in the sheep, we shall come rejoicing, ringing in the sheep. One hundred twenty-five. Have you a heart that's weary, sending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know the Lord might be Do you know? Then 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, where shall the back of me come? And take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Thou art. 